please give it up for Como. Yes, Como. Yes. <laughs> okay. I could see their lips moving, um, but I, I couldn't comprehend what they were saying. Uh, these two people I loved, standing in my kitchen, our friends for so long. But my, my brain, it, it couldn't figure it out. Their lips were moving. They were up on the sides. They were smiling. They were joking. They were waiting for my response, but my brain couldn't respond. My, my brain was broken. I wasn't used to listening to my body, but in, in that moment, it was shouting, leave, leave this room. This isn't safe. This isn't safe because we can't figure out what's wrong with your brain. So I just left the room without explanation. And I went to my bedroom and I fell to the ground. Hunger and self loathing inside of me. I was used to moving rooms of hundreds or thousands of people with my words through having meaningful dialogue and conversation. But in my own kitchen, my brain was broken and I couldn't even speak to the person in front of me. A few months earlier, I had been diagnosed with cancer. After surviving cancer, illness, the stress from my life and my addiction to productivity had broken my brain. I was a child of immigrants. I was told to work hard. I was told to hustle like they did. I felt guilty when I rested, but my body and my mind were making me rest. So as I wiped the tears from my face that day, crumpled as a heap on the floor of my bedroom, I knew I had two paths in front of me. The first, wither away, keep doing this to yourself, keep breaking your body, or the second, was to choose to live. That was the moment I chose life. Now, like any good overachiever, I made my to-do lists. This is the A to Z of how I was going to heal. My weekly acupuncture, my weekly therapy, my monthly massages, my daily walks outdoors. My brain was getting really good at this. But then my body spoke up again. It's not enough to have your lists. What you need even more is presence. And so the next day when I walked through the pines, I stopped and I noticed the brown needles on the ground carpeting the forest floor. When I looked up and smelt that smell of pine, I saw the wind moving the trees ever so gently. I learned how to be present. I learned how to cherish the small moments. Those months retrained me on how to live. But as my husband would say to me later, when life got chaotic again, when we ask for courage, God isn't just going to hand it to us, but he's going to give us the opportunities to be courageous. I asked him where he'd heard that, and he told me it was when Morgan Freeman played God in Bruce Almighty. <laughs> I said, okay, babe, thank you for getting so philosophical on me. And so in the months ahead, we had two big milestones in front of us. The first, our wedding. He was Canadian, I was South Asian. It took four years for my family to accept him. This was a big deal for us and I wanted to be fully immersed. And the second was my final surgery. I'd elected to have it after the wedding so that I could really enjoy this part of my life before getting into the heaviness of another recovery. And so I walked that path. He took my hand as we walked into the hospital and it reminded me of walking back out the aisle after we had exchanged vows. As they took off my rings before surgery, as I had to take the polish off my nails, months earlier, I had been adorned so fully with henna all over my hands, dripping in jewelry from my culture. And as I was fully stripped of everything except a scratchy piece of cloth on top of me before heading into the OR. And as Mitch kissed my forehead and walked away, I was left once again alone, 
but not crying on my bedroom floor, but trusting that the changes in my life I had made would help me through whatever came on the other side of that OR. And as I looked up at the light up above me in the operating room and counted down from 20 and felt myself slowly drift away, I knew I was safe with myself. I had learned how to live. I'd learned how to trust myself. And when my eyes opened, I was months ahead. The spotlight was on me, but a different kind of spotlight. I was sitting on stage with 8,000 people around me. And across from me was Michelle Obama. I had the privilege of interviewing her for an hour on her book tour. And it was in that moment with that spotlight that my body screamed, take this moment in. And as I asked a question that had our former first lady tearing up, I took in the stadium where years earlier, I couldn't hold that conversation with the people I loved in my kitchen. I was now holding space and holding the attention of an audience of 8,000 once again. Only this time, it wasn't about the shininess. It wasn't about them. It wasn't about the checkbox. It was about that moment. And it was about living fully into my life on my terms. Thank you. Woo! Yes, come on. Yes.